What is it about the wines from Jura and the French Alps that makes them different from any other wine regions in the world? Why should you consider visiting these lovely resort areas? And which, uh, which mouthwatering local dishes and cheeses would pair best with these wines? Well, tonight you're going to get those stories and insider tips and more. If you're watching this video on the replay, please, in the comments, type the word replay. I want to know where you're logging in from. Uh, what's your city? What's the weather like? What's in your glass? And of course, if you're here with me live, I want to hear from you as well. Um, I'm Natalie McLean, and I teach online wine and food pairing courses, and you've just uh, joined one of the most passionate groups of wine lovers who gather every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern to talk to the most interesting people in the world of wine, like our guest, whom I'll introduce momentarily. Now, I'm live streaming this video for the first time, but it is based on a recording that I made for my podcast, Unreserved Wine Talk. I will be here with you live in the comments. So jump in there. Let us know or let me know, you know, what tips and stories you're enjoying. Uh, what questions do you have? And I'll be responding to you, as they say, in real time. Now, before I introduce our guest, just let me say that one of you is going to win a copy of one of her terrific books about Jura and the French Alps. All you have to do is email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com. Oh, she's set. Oh, she's ready for the product shot. Thank you. Thank you, Wink. There you go. Beautiful book. Um, and tell me that you want to win a copy. So email me, natalie at nataliemcclain.com, and let me know you want to win a copy. Or also post that in the comments here. I'll choose one person randomly from those who contact me. So back to our guest. British wine writer and educator Wink Lorch splits her time between London and the French Alps and Jura. She's the author of two award-winning books, Jura Wine and the Wines of the French Alps, Savoie, Bougie, and Beyond. Both books were funded or part funded by a Kickstarter, by Kickstarter campaigns, which intrigues me a lot, and are now part of the prestigious Academy de Vin Library. Wink is also a regular contributor on Jura and Savoie to Jancis Robinson's Oxford Companion to Wine, Hugh Johnson's Pocket Wine, and to books by Tom Stevenson and Oz Clark, as well as numerous print and online magazines, from Decanter to Wine Searcher. As a founder member of the Association of Wine Educators in the UK, Wink has taught for the WSET at the, Dip at the Diploma Level 4 for over a decade and is a regular speaker for wine clubs and corporate events. She's currently working on a companion volume for her first book, Jura Wine, which will be named Jura Wine 10 Years On. It will be published in the summer of 2024, and she's already run a successful Kickstarter campaign to help fund its publication. Wink joins us now from her home in London. Welcome, Wink. We're so glad you're here. Thanks, Natalie. Great to be with you here. Awesome. All right. So let's dive right in. What is it that first drew you to, now I know these regions are very different and we're going to distinguish them, but generally what drew you to Jura and the French Alps in the first place? Well, it was very much the French Alps to begin with. Um, I was very lucky in that uh, as a child, I was taken skiing, mainly in Switzerland. Um, later on as an adult, I gravitated towards skiing in France. It was a bit easier, a bit cheaper. And uh, I already worked in wine when I was, I, I started working in the world of wine at a very young age. And so whenever- How I, young were you, by the way? Well, when I started working in wine? Um, yes. Uh, about 20. Oh, okay. So you were legal. <laughs> Yeah, depending. Yeah, yes. One with the ages, and, yeah. Uh, um, I originally worked for wine importers in the UK, and whenever I went on a, a ski vacation, occasionally on the way up to the ski resort, I would see vineyards, and I'd be going, "Wow, there's vineyards here. What are they doing here? They're <laughs> very high," and and I really didn't know anything more than that. And then uh, just over. 30 years ago, I uh, invested in a, a small property in the French Alps and uh, in Savoie. Mm. And that led me to discovering Savoie wine, because when I went, not necessarily in the winter, but if I went in the summer, I would uh, always try and visit 
the nearby vineyards. And at the time, 30 years ago, these wines almost never left the region. Hmm. Um, so uh, they were all sold to thirsty tourists who were skiing in the winter or, or just having a great time hiking or hanging around the lakes in the summer. And uh, so gradually I got to know them and they intrigued me because they tended to be made from unusual grapes and which among us who work in wine for a long time doesn't love trying wines from a grape you've never heard of before. Absolutely. And, uh, I, they were light, fresh. I enjoyed them. Uh, at the time, they weren't high-class wines, but um, I valued getting to know them. And <laughs> that was really about it for a while. Wow. Uh, but, uh, Let me just stop you there for a yeah. moment, Wink. Yeah. Um, having a, a home in the, in the French Alps just sounds so romantic and so escapist fantasy, like Peter Mayle in A Year of Provence. Tell us what it looks like there. Pa paint a picture of the landscape. I mean, you're, you're driving and you're seeing vines, so it's obviously not all snow. And then you're coming up to these. Well, you tell us. What, what is it like there? Uh, well, where the area that I'm based in, uh, albeit in a, a different home to formerly, is, is a ski area. So mm. these are, are not that, these villages are not that remote there their ski resorts and mm -hmm. uh, so built up but with drop dead gorgeous mountain views in the background and mm -hmm. uh, snow in the winter um, where I am based is not in the high alps um, technically it's in what's known as the pre-alps which is pretty important ex uh, a pretty important expression when it comes to wine as well, because the vineyards in Savoie are grown on the foothills of the pre-Alps. Okay. The foothills of the Alps. And ah. the pre-Alps is a little bit, you, you have the same thing in South America. You have the Andes, and then you have what they call the pre-Cordillera. And these are lower mountain ranges that are actually geologically different. So coming back to the Alps, the pre-Alps are limestone based and they're older and the, the big Alps where mm -hmm. you've sort of got Mont Blanc and famous mountains like the Matterhorn in Switzerland and so on, they're effectively granite based. Ah. And so there's quite a difference for when we come to talk about the wine. Um, but yeah, in the, the views in the summer are very different to the winter in the summer it is really heidi land if anybody's heard of heidi heidi uh, yes you, and she was always tending that, goats that was a childhood story yeah, she had well, various um, cheeses it's cows um where oh. i live is the heart of riblachon country uh, oh, riblachon riblachon. is, a, is a, a cow cheese a soft cow cheese and uh mm. Um, it's been made there for hundreds of years. Uh, the ski area that I'm in has got what we call real villages rather than actually places. Pop-up village? Skiing. <laughs> yes, uh, well, storybook. what they did in the 1970s onwards, really, for the ski industry. We, I'm actually in an area of real villages with a weekly market and cheese sales, and farmers, mm. gorgeous hiking and not too far from a fabulous city called Annecy. And okay. Annecy, which has got a, a lake as well, is a beautiful place to visit. Um, hmm. Everyone should go there once in their life. <laughs> that sounds beautiful. So while we're talking geography, for those who aren't familiar with exactly where the French Alps are, and Jura by extension, uh, in eastern France. So they are along the border of Switzerland, but maybe you can paint us a, a, a visual map of where we would find them. Uh, absolutely. And also this visual map might explain why Jura and Savoie used to be always linked together in wine books and wine magazines. These days, as they get better known, they're beginning to be separated i'm pleased to to say and i i hope that i've been part of the driver for that separation um but so to picture it you need to start with geneva 
So the city of Geneva in Switzerland is right on the border of France and it's at the western end of a big lake which most of us English speaking people know of as Lake Geneva but its technical name is Lac Le Mans or Lake Le Mans. So that runs from Geneva in the west to the east and its northern and eastern shores are all Switzerland and its southern shore is Haute Savoie or the upper part of Savoie in France. So try and picture Geneva in your mind and now go south and slightly west of there until you hit the city of Lyon. So Lyon is, is one of France's most famous cities. Um, it is in wine terms north of the uh, Côte de Rhone area. So the Savoie area, the Savoie wine area, is uh, a lot of little islands of vineyards because it, it's a very, very small surface area of vineyards and they are interspersed between lakes, rivers, and obviously they can't be up those big mountains I talked about earlier. So there are many little islands spread over a geographic area running south of Geneva um, towards Lyon, but not quite hitting Lyon, and then east over to the Italian border and the Alps uh, where Chamonix is. So Chamonix Mont Blanc is a, a pretty famous area as well. So they're, they're in these little parcels. Obviously, one needs a real map to see it. Jura, on the other hand, is not that far away in one sense, uh, but it's northwest of Geneva. So before we were south and now we're going northwest of Geneva. So the Jura wine region is named after the Jura Mountains. So the Jura Mountains are an old uh, range of mountains that is a lower range of mountains than the Alps and runs down forming a border between France and, and, and Switzerland on the east. So the Jura vineyards are on the lowest foothills of the Jura mountains, so west of the Jura mountains. And west of them, uh, there is a big plain that's called the Brest Plain. And west of that is Burgundy. So hmm. Jura is closer to the vineyards of Burgundy and the Savoie and Alpine regions are closer to the vineyards of the Northern Rhone. And indeed they have more in common with them as and Jura has more in common with Burgundy. Burgundy, and you once even said that, is it Jura that is kind of like a mirror image in the of Burgundy in the way that the vineyards are planted? Uh, it is in a sense, uh, it's more the geography or the geology of the area. Okay. Um, what I, I I had to do an awful lot of uh, study in geo. It's my weakest point: geology and soils. And when I was writing my books, I realised I had to have a chapter on the soils and the geology, and that was extremely challenging. And I I sort of found geologists um, and soil specialists in the region to help me. Hmm. And uh, there's a wonderful man called Michel Compi in, in the Jura who helped me in particular there. And he explained what happened. Now, I'm hopeless on remembering figures as well, but we're talking of millions and millions of years ago. So you had the, um, the whole of this, that area of France was covered in sea, in the sea. So that's why we have um, calcium and why we have fossils. So if you think which create the limestone, fossils, yeah. Okay. Exactly. It all comes from the fact that the area was covered in the sea. So Burgundy was as well. Burgundy and Jura is what I'm talking about at the moment. Um, the Jura Mountains emerged many, many millions and millions of years ago. And then much later to the east of Jura, the French Alps, which uh, or the Alps as a whole, which are a young mountain range, they there was this upthrust, and they arrived and they pushed the Jura Mountains westwards, <laughs> and they collapsed into a series of plateaux, 
and they created thereafter there was this sort of dip which is i think also called the sone which is the river graben and then there were other sort of gentle mountains that that form the hillsides of burgundy that we know today so right. we've suddenly got this sort of dip in the middle and these two the mirror images of burgundy uh, of of Jura over here, Burgundy over here. Yes. Um, so, what has happened is that Jura, both of them, are known for very simple clay limestone soils. Except they're not simple at all. They're highly complicated with all sorts of variations. But generally, there's more clay in the Jura and there's more limestone in Burgundy. Huge mm. generalization. That's okay. We're into that here since we don't have six hours on this podcast. Um, but you were saying also that the the um, the wines or the vineyards of Jura tend to be uh, planted facing west, whereas in Burgundy, you know, the Cote d'Or, you get southeast exposure, which is the coveted, you know, early morning sun. Um, but is that also a facet of the how the vineyards are planted in terms of being a mirror image that Jura tends to be facing west i don't know if it's northwest but just west um some of them are but okay. there are also uh, as usual in wine it's more complicated than that in that sure. they're not all just in one strip um, yep. there were little hills that broke off from the jura mountains and on those little hills you have some of the more famous vineyards and they'll be facing in all sorts of different directions yeah it's amazing what what's happened how the mountains and the hills have changed um you noted in one conversation there was or article there's a severe weather storm in 1248 and mount grenier um what happened to it? There's something with the top of it fell off? <laughs> well, we have to move back down to Savoie for that. So okay. So I'm just going to park up Jura in order to answer your question. And sure. Move down to Savoie. So Mont Granier is the northernmost mountain of a little range, a little pre-Alpine range, so a limestone range uh, called the Chartreuse. And... Uh, You'll have heard of the monastery of Chartreuse and the liqueur that comes from from there, and uh, it's it's all the same Chartreuse uh, mountains. Mont Granier, um, uh, it is documented in, in church records, and otherwise we wouldn't know this because twelve forty eight there wasn't that much <laughs> publication about weather systems and so on but apparently uh, the month of November in 1248 was extremely wet massive rainstorms going on and on and on limestone is very soft the mountains tend to have natural caves in them and uh, in this appalling weather in the middle of the night um, this mountain, the top of the mountain, appears to have broken off, <laughs> which then triggered a massive landslide. And this massive landslide uh, buried everything in its path. And wow. at the time, there were, they say, about five settlements, small towns, villages, um, which would have been people living, subsistence living, um, although the Alps were crossroads, so I imagine there were travellers there and so on. Um, every single living being in the path of this landslide um, would have lost their lives. Wow. So all the people and all the animals and, and so on. And the landslide stopped just before this particular church or, or small monastery, which is how come they documented it. Hmm. And for several hundred years, um, nobody resettled that specific area. You know, there were rocks strewn everywhere. And then gradually by the um, 18th century, uh, so several hundred years afterwards, they realized that they could, it would be sensible to resettle it and that there was a certain amount of the debris that they could clear. And that if there was one crop that they could um, plant it was vines because <laughs> vines can cope with a, a rocky surface I mean it was right. no way you could could plant 
arable crops and it wasn't ideal for grazing cows either because of all these rocks everywhere and no grass so um they planted vines and um the best known not necessarily the finest area for vineyards but the most densely planted area uh with a these days a white grape called chacare is um in the foot of Mont Granier, because Mont Granier still exists. And uh, if I could be so bold as to show you the cover of this again. Sure. You see Your Mont wines of French there. Alps. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you see that vertical yeah. is where it fell off. Wow. And then, that is dramatic. And, and that's why it's that that shape and down in under my fingers here are vineyards so uh, and we'll put a, a link and a picture of the book your book in the show notes uh wink for those who are listening only and uh aren't seeing the video of our conversation so yeah right. that so, yeah that's very good um and so i was intrigued the caves filled with water the the limestone caves filled with water and made the mountain very unstable as well I believe so, and I believe and yeah. it's still very unstable. Although the oh. experts that be say that there's unlikely to be anything of the gravity of twelve forty eight, but in right. two thousand and sixteen, um, there were quite dramatic slides there, and they, of course, these days uh, they were videoed. And um, yeah. if you if you can tap in French into YouTube, uh, the word for landslide, um, and uh, and and just sort of play around in French and put in landslide and Mont Granier, you'll find and 2016 you'll find some pretty spectacular videos because huh. uh, there was one particular landslide that actually did cut off the main uh, pass road that goes over there it didn't quite hit the vineyards or or any of the villages um so you know there wasn't any loss of life of anything like that yeah oh that reminds me of um visiting sicily and the lava flow coming coming right you know right to a head before some vineyards, and then they put up a Virgin Mary to statue, and it looks like she's telling the lava to stop. But that sort of reminds me a little bit of this um, Chart Chartreuse uh, monastery. Um, but that, as yeah. you say, is why we have the documentation. I don't know if God intervened or if God caused the thing in the first place, or God has nothing to do with it. Anyway, I don't know either. <laughs> that's not for this podcast. But anyway, here we go. Now, another spot of history, and I may be crisscrossing regions again, you can situate me because prior to this discussion, I had not read much at all about Jura and the French Alps. So you're helping me and those who are listening to our conversation figure out the differences. But I wanted to just touch on another spot of history, and, and that is that um, Louis Pasteur made his home somewhere in this region. You're going to tell me where in a moment, but just to, I'm sure everybody's heard of him, but he, he is the sci scientist who discovered pasteurization, the partial sterilization of a product like milk to make it safe for consumption, as well as the rabies vaccine and breakthroughs in wine and beer fermentation. So where did he live and is there a museum we can visit if we travel to the region? Um, well, Pasteur actually was born in the Jura. Okay. So he was born in um, a town called Dole, uh, but very soon after he was born as a child, his family moved to Arbois. And Arbois is a beautiful little town, which is the wine capital today of Jura. So hmm. we're quite a way away. We've gone back up now yes. um, to Arbois. And uh, he he was he spent his whole childhood there and then he went for further education to bigger cities and because he was so bright he ended up in Paris uh, but what was interesting is that he had family in Arbois and he used to come back uh, in the long summer vacation that, that the French have always been famous for and back in his day in the 19th century and he was attached to a university in Paris and he would get on a train uh, he would send his family on ahead and then he would get on a train and he would take his whole laboratory on the train because he didn't want to stop work 
and wow. he would set up a laboratory, a temporary one in his vacation in the town of Arbois, usually in a vignerons cellar. So, um, and he used the fact that there were vineyards there and that there was also some very unusual wines being made in Jura, which I hope we'll get to talk about, Van Jean. Yes. Um, so he used the fact that this was being made as part of his experiments. Huh. And uh, it is said that he, he actually had his own vineyard, uh, a small vineyard, and he conducted experiments in this vineyard. And the one that I love the most is that he... I mean, he had assistants, you know, he was pretty famous, but they went into the vineyard and they, uh, just before harvest, before right, before the, the grapes were fully ripe, and they decided to cover some of the bunches with uh, the equivalent of um, cotton, cotton wool. Okay. And uh, so, you know, there was no plastic in those days, but it's like imagining if you put a plastic bag over a bunch of grapes, but there was no plastic. So he covered them in cotton, half of them uh, uh, of a certain row in cotton wool and the other half he just left as they were. And then when the grapes were picked, the ones that had the cotton wool around them uh, would not ferment because uh, the yeast, the natural yeast on those bunches was not able to, uh, to live, to breathe because the cotton wool was there. Huh. whereas the ones that were free, they fermented fine. And he did this to prove the fact that because at the time he was being disparaged and his theories were not liked and so on, and he used it to prove that yeast and bacteria and other small organisms could not exist without air present. <laughs> And I just wow. find it amazing that it's there. Yeah. So in order to learn more about that, you can indeed visit. Um, there are actually Pasteur museums in various different places. But in the Jura area, there is the Maison de Pasteur, the Pasteur's house, which is the old family house. Um, and it's recently had a refit because uh, he's recently... Uh, had his uh, 100th anniversary celebrated or 100th anniversary of his... I should know death, I think, um, but I sh I, I'm sure it's not his birth anyway. <laughs> so um, the Maison de Pasteur is, is something you can visit while in Arbois. That sounds fabulous. Lots to do here. And we'll get back to more tips on, on traveling there because you are an expert in that as well. So let's go back to the mar mountains. What effect do they have on the vineyards? Um, do they dictate the weather or heavily influence it? Um, certainly... In Savoie in particular, where the, the mountains are closer, um, high mountains are closer. That's what I, I really mean. The, the proper Alps are very, very close. And so they do have a big influence on the vineyards in that um, everything's just more dramatic. Um, hmm. So the rainfall will be heavier. The When you do get hailstorms, they'll be stronger. Um, they also, the valleys can actually get very hot. People think that this is just cool climate area, end of story. It's not as simple as that. The summers can be very hot indeed. The vineyards huh. tend to be on steep slopes facing mainly south um, in, in Savoie, and they are on hard rock. And so the, um, that can also reflect the sun and uh, so... They'll be pretty hot in summer. Um, these days, you don't get much snow. I mean, climate change has been a huge factor in both Savoie and Jura. I know it's a huge factor everywhere in the world. But in these somewhat marginal areas that used to be somewhat marginal, which were in many years, 50 years ago, in many years, uh, the grapes didn't properly ripen. Whereas hmm. these days, there's never a problem with ripening. In fact, um, there are other issues, and other problems. So, there's What are the other problems that are coming up as a result? Uh, well, the, the problems are that uh, spring frost, for example, um, seems to happen more regularly than it did. 
um, <laughs> in that, uh, I mean, it's a worry even right now. I mean, this is February. The vines should be absolutely fast asleep right now in in this part of France and in fact everywhere. It should be midwinter. It should be really cold. It's been unseasonably warm. There mm. has been very little snow. The 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 ski areas are suffering with a lack of snow. Everybody's already terrified that if this continues for the next few weeks, that the vines will start to bud. Now, if they start to bud uh, soon after the, the leaves will start to form, if you then have got three or four leaves and April comes and we have a cold snap that often happens, you can have potentially a loss of your whole crop. Wow. Uh, in a, a bit of a spring frost. And this is what happened in 2021. And this is happening more and more frequently. And it's much more dangerous than before because the vines are further advanced before mm -hmm. the frost hits. So that's You know, that's really interesting, Wink, because in BC, they just had a, an extreme cold snap. And they say they're going to have 97% crop loss. It's incredible uh, and devastating. It's yeah. Awful. Yeah. Um, I, unfortunately, these desperate weather events are happening all over. And the other thing that happens that is more extreme than before is when they get hail storms, both, both Jura and Savoie being not too far from mountains, uh, were prone to hail storms anyway. But okay. in the past, they would be very localized, um, just a small area somewhere. Uh, the hailstones would be sort of pea-sized and um, yes, there would be damage, but uh, not nearly as devastating as today. These days, there's a risk that uh, the hailstorms are with bigger stones for a start. You know, they, they love uh, the, uh, I, I worked for a while for uh, uh, a news organization for wine searcher and uh, we used to get feed from uh, agence france presse and they would talk about in french and they would write about the latest hail storm somewhere in france uh, in the vineyards and they would use different words to describe the size of the hailstones and they would say hailstones as big as pigeon eggs <laughs> Right. Sounds decidedly I French. I don't know how big a pigeon egg is, but uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> but yeah, go uh, big, much bigger hailstones and much longer, twenty minutes instead of three minutes huh. uh, over a much bigger area. So wow. these are these are some of, some of the hazards. Uh, then there's drought problems, even in these areas that are known for rain, and when the rain does come it's heavier and longer, and therefore you have mildew problems. So the great side of climate change is that we've now got some fabulous red wines from Savoie and some fabulous red wines from Jura, if you can get them. Um, but availability is very, very short. Um, right. In the old days, they were no good. Now they're great, but we can't get them. So, yes. Uh, well, yeah, you mentioned that the production of this region is minuscule, 0.2%, I believe, of all French wine, and only 6% of it is exported. So approximately how much is that? Like how many bottles or whatever do they produce a year? Okay, well, just to clarify, the 0.2%, yep. Jura produces about point. Jura and Savoie are yes. about the same size, um, okay. about 2,000 hectares uh, or a little bit more, that's about 5,000 acres of vineyards okay. in each. Um, and then the French Alps has got some other little regions around Bouget, Isère, and a few others that I include in my book. Okay. Um, but altogether, it's still minuscule. Um, so the uh, production varies hugely um, in Jura, it used to be that you would say there would be an average of 10 million bottles a year. Um, that's very, very little. I mean, there are hmm. big New World producers, wine producers, out of Europe wine producers that that produce that one producer. 
So yes. these days with the difficult vintages that they've had, particularly in Jura, it can be as as little as, as 5 million bottles. Um, <laughs> uh, exports in uh, Jura have exploded and are up at about 30% now. Oh, wow. Um, okay. In Savoie, um, the quantity produced is a little more than Jura um, because yields are a little higher and they haven't had quite so many difficulties, um, but 12 to 15 million bottles a year, if anyone can picture that. Um, mm -hmm. And exports, um, I had, don't have the latest figures, but uh, uh, they'll be up at about 10 percent now, something mm -hmm. like that. Oh, good to know. And so, as you've said, traditionally, these were wines were regarded as ski resort wines. Um, in my mind, that conjures up something that's best smothered with the cheese fondue um, or the equivalent of, uh, you know, traditional cruise ship food. But you you said that um, these wines traditionally had a Beaujolais problem. What did you mean by that? Oh, did I say that? My yeah, <laughs> in one conversation. That's okay if you don't recall it. Um, um, well, Savoir we're talking about rather than Jura. Um, sure. The, the two regions have, have really entirely different issues and uh, so on. So the Savoir, uh, which are the vineyards that are closest to ski resorts, to famous ski resorts, so like Val d'Isère, like Chamonix, like Meribel, Val Torrance, Megève. Just thought I'd throw a few in there. Sure. Flynn, Avoria, <laughs> and my own ski resorts. So I don't want to tell anybody about like, <laughs> yeah. uh, Le Grand Badon. Um, uh -huh. All of these ski resorts um, used to lap up all the wines that uh, Savoy could produce, more or less. And that is because they were frequented by mainly the French in the past. And the French are very loyal to their um, regional products. So when the French would go on holiday, they would um, always choose local wine, local food from wherever they went. That isn't always the case of um, foreigners coming to France who are sometimes looking for foods from home and drinks that they're used to. Uh -huh. So the problem that I would have been referring to that absolutely doesn't exist anymore um, in Savoie is that 20, 30 years ago, the quality of Savoie wines was um, in many cases very ordinary and in some cases downright bad. And so what would happen would be that people on this the ski holiday might say, well, we'll have a Savoie wine and then would be very disappointed in it and never buy it again. So they were sort of a victim of their own success. Mm -hmm. um, and and the whole, the whole, they, they sold out easily because it was a tiny, right. tiny. It was a ready market and a tiny market. But, yeah. But it pulled everywhere downwards. And that's a little bit what happened in Beaujolais with the Beaujolais Nouveau phenomenon. Um, again 30 odd years ago but life is very different today i'm very happy to say beaujolais produces some fantastic wines and so does savoir produce some fantastic days hmm. uh, wines thanks really to new generations that see things differently and who have worked better in the vineyards better in the winery and are commanding better prices and export helps to drive that and so there's an onward climb up the mountain, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. Well. And you've noted that, you know, especially the wines of Jura have become sort of the darlings of sommeliers in high-end uh, Manhattan restaurants. Why there? Uh, I mean, I can understand that they're probably very food friendly because they're you know, bright acidity and fresh, but why did New York City psalms really glom onto the wines of Jura? Um, well, this really started about um, 12, 12 years ago, really, I would say, before my first book, which I'll just show. For, there you go. Another product um, placement. So, <laughs> sure yes. Wine, uh, this book was published in 2014, 10 years ago, which is why yeah. I'm doing a new one 10 years on. Um, so at, 
by the time that that book came out, um, Jura wines were very much present in the New York market. In fact, there were more, there was more selection of Jura wine in New York than there was in Paris. Wow. Um, I know. Huh. So why? Yeah. It's a very good question. I think it was a series of stars that aligned. First of all, all credit to uh, a handful of importers, U.S. importers, um, who had always been looking for European wines, especially French wines that were from smaller producers, had a stamp of authenticity about them, originality, and so on. So a few of them in their travels and realizing that Burgundy was going up in price and looking for something different, decided to take a look at Jura. And at the same time, the vignerons in Jura were beginning to do a better and better job. Um, and what they discovered there surprised everybody, as it surprised me on my first visits, because I discovered Jura much later than Savoie, um, only 20 years ago. And uh, I was astonished by the diversity of wines there that were nothing like any wines that I'd got to know anywhere in the world. <laughs> um, and yes, Chardonnay is grown there. Yes, Chardonnay is the most planted variety. But uh, with the noble exception of Clément de Jura, the wines don't taste like Chardonnay from anywhere else and really hard to compare. Huh. Um, and there are also three indigenous, there's Pinot Noir grown there too, after all they're close to, to Burgundy, but there are three indigenous varieties, Sauvignon, Trousseau and Pulsar. And nobody ever heard of these grapes and, uh, and nobody understood the wines they were made from. And this presented a big challenge, but I think the New York market is, a, and, and it, it's not so much the high-end restaurants that adopted this. It's okay. the more trendy restaurants ah. and wine bars in South Manhattan in particular, um, around sort of Greenwich and, and Tribeca and, and around there. There's some very interesting wine stores, wine stores like Chambers Street that, that backed these wines. And, um, and that's how it started. But there's also something else that I don't know whether I should dare say. Oh, I please. I don't know whether it was me who first said this or someone else. So if somebody Go is for tuning it. <laughs> in that said this first before me, I don't know. But I do remember talking about this a long time ago. I, one of the curiosities was that the red wines were in particular enjoyed by um, switched on geeky wine drinkers in New York uh, as long ago as 12 years ago. Now, the red wines from Jura are very pale in color, um, crisp acidity, very low tannin quite funky flavors, sort of funky, uh, um, brambly, um, very earthy, unusual flavors. <laughs> and I'm going to go back to the beginning, pale in color. True. Sure. So at the time, about 12 years ago, there was these rumblings of people looking for something that was not exactly enjoyed by Robert Parker and his aficionados and his team. So these became... That, that being, just for those who may not know, big U.S. critic, uh, since retired, wine advocate, first to popularize scores out of 100. But yes, and he tend or he was... Um, people said he loved the big, huge fruit bombs. But yes, I can imagine these would be so almost the polar opposite. Diametrically <laughs> opposite. Yes. So it was a little bit of that as well. It was mm -hmm. like a, a reaction, almost a, wow, you know, this is just the opposite. And and then it snowballed from then. And then eventually people even, I'm, on my first visits, I said, 
very rudely, very ignorantly. I said I didn't want to try Chardonnay because there was so much Chardonnay all over the world. That was hmm. mad. And it was disrespectful because there's so much Chardonnay there. And then I discovered that their Chardonnay was so different and, and there were some really high quality Chardonnays being made there. Um, and some of them can be compared with Burgundy and can give Burg and, and, uh, although they've been going up and up and up in price from the Jura, the, uh, ones from Burgundy have been going up and up and up and up in price <laughs> as well. Yeah. There's still a deal so by comparison. There's still a deal in comparison. And quality-wise, in Jura, they've been going up and up and up as well. And so um, it's, it's a, a fascinating area. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, there isn't enough to go around, especially from the trendy producers. So <laughs> I would urge everybody to just keep looking at at new names that you've not heard of before and um, there are new names cropping up and being imported into every country of the of the world that loves good wine at the moment mm -hmm. if but in minuscule quantities and when i say minuscule quantities importers are often given allocations of maybe 48 bottles of a particular cuvee of wine wow. so then They've got their string of customers they sell to. So they sell to say to this restaurant, you can have three bottles. They sell yeah. to this wine store, you can have three bottles. Not a lot to go around. <laughs> right. <laughs> so jump on it if you see these wines. Right. OK, but let's talk about Vin Jaune or yellow wine and how it's similar to or different from sherry, uh, the traditional fortified wine from um, Spain. Well, um, it's quite different, even though um, it's right to draw the comparison, Natalie, it really is, because they're, they're both um, uh, what's known as biologically aged wines, but with an oxidative character as well, which is all very confusing. <laughs> um, but <laughs> they, uh, they are extremely different. Okay. So I will talk about Vangeon first and attempt to explain it. Vangeon, uh, the word Joan means yellow, um, hence the cover of my book. This is a there is another good product placement. Yep. Jura wine. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, I, I tend not use, to use the term yellow wine because honestly, the wine never looks yellow in the glass. And, uh. Uh, um, it's um, and it sounds more romantic to to stick to the French and just say vin jaune, Does. but to translate the jaune as yellow, of course. Um, so vin jaune is made by from exclusively one of the Jura grapes, which is called Savagnin. Um, Savagnin is a late ripener, and they start off uh, picking it when it's it's very healthy, very ripe, um, it and only the very best of course um and they begin by making a white wine just like any other white wine so goes through fermentation and then in the springtime they put it into barrel um it doesn't usually ferment in barrel in this particular case it usually ferments in tank and they put it into barrel and what is important is that the barrels are a always old and when i say old and these are small barrels like barriques or burgundy barrels of 228 liters um 400 odd gallons so um no that's wrong i can't remember what they are in gallons but uh, standard barrel sizes and these barrels are in a cave a cellar a vin jaune a specific vin jaune cellar Okay. Now, Jura breaks all the rules in so many things. That's why I was so bemused the first time I went there and tried to learn about it. And a vin jaune cellar for the barrels um, is noted for having uh, temperature differences. And we normally talk about the ideal cellar as being a constant temperature. Oh, no. Right. For vin jaune. Huh. You need temperature differences. And in some parts, uh, it depends on the village you're in and the village traditions as to how big those temperature differences are. But if you're in Arbois, then um, because the windows will be open in these 
cellars and the cellars <laughs> will sometimes be attics <laughs> really so lofts <sighs> so the barrels will be there with the window open and that means that in the winter the temperature may go down below zero to in centigrade um minus five and in summer they will go up to plus 30 centigrade wow so a massive difference in addition um the barrels are not filled to the top so um a natural yeast layer um, known as the veil or the voile in french forms on top of the wine surface and protects it from the worst of oxidation and gives its own taste to it and during those changing temperatures during the year um, it becomes uh, either fully forming across uh, the, the surface of the wine or it just sort of breaks up a bit and there are a few holes and then it comes together again and it's a living thing and it moves in it sounds a bit revolting but but they these are <laughs> it's fascinating yeast, but yeah. it moves in the wine it's all very very mysterious and did the, the and, types of yeast change over time uh probably not no but no? it's a okay. mixture of yeast and ah. um I'll talk about sherry in a minute, although I'm not a not not an expert in it, but I I know more than at least more than the fundamentals. So um, sure. The other key to the making of vin jaune, and there are, are quite a few oxidative sa oxidative Sauvignon from the Jura that are made in this way, but don't stay the course to be labelled vin jaune. Um, the wine has to have stayed for over five years in the barrel without <laughs> ever being moved, no racking, no touching, except to test it to make sure that things are going along the way. And it's not allowed to be released until six years and three months after the harvest. Wow. So just now, um, January, February, they, uh, 2024, um, they are re beginning to release the 2017s. Hmm. So right now you won't be able to buy any Vinjone that is um, younger than 2017. If you see it, it's a fake. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So whereas um, Sherry, everything is different, but the comparison is specifically with Fino Sherry, um, which uh, the, what they have in common is that they, Fino Sherry is also aged under that layer of, uh, of yeast, of floor yeast, as it's known there. I believe the actual um, biology of the yeast, the, the nature of them is somewhat different. But what is also different is that because they're using um, the Palomino grape um, grown in southern Spain, in Andalusia, um, the acidity is not nearly so high as with the Sauvignon grape grown in Jura. The mm. other difference is that Vin Jaune and the oxidative Sauvignons of uh, Jura are never fortified, whereas right. um, in Sherry there's always a level of fortification. And I think if we go into any more detail, we'll get yeah. all yes. the or, or they'll need a drink of Vin Jaune, <laughs> too exactly. sweet. Um, so t tell us what Vangeon tastes like. Oh, well, um, it's a real shock to the palate the first time ah. you have it. Oh, yeah? It's exceedingly dry. Okay. Um, a big whack of acidity. Um, you, when you smell it, if, you've no, if you're not expecting it, you might think it was off. Um, there's a sort of... Um, there should not be a rancid smell, but if you've never tried it before, you might immediately go, oh, 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 there's something wrong with this, um, madderization or something like that. But that come back again, come back again, smell it again. Huh. And you might notice walnuts. You might just start to notice the smell of um, 
certain spices that you might be familiar with using made in curries like uh, fenugreek, ginger, that sort of thing. When you taste <laughs> it, that real shock of acidity um, and uh, there's nothing smooth about it. <laughs> it's the opposite <laughs> of smooth, but there's a huge amount of complexity in it. And for a beginner Vangeon drinker, I would suggest having a piece of Conte cheese. So Conte cheese is the most um, famous or even infamous cheese of the Jura specifically. Um, Why is it infamous? Well, it's infamous because it's actually the most um, produced cheese in the whole of France. Ah. So therefore, in the supermarkets, you will find a very ordinary quality um, I, I, of of um, Conte, a little bit like, well, certainly in England, uh, if you take cheddar, you can right. find very, very ordinary cheddar and you can find incredibly tasty farmhouse cheddar. <laughs> well, it's just the same with Conte. Um, so Conte is a very famous cheese and when it's good, it's very, very good indeed. Um, and, uh, and what does it taste like? Well, if you're familiar with Gruyere, it's 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 that type of, of cheese. I'm I'm no good at giving descriptors for cheese. Maybe a bit nutty. It's a hard cheese. Uh, depends yeah. Depends on the age of it and the style sure. and so on. But okay. the two together are an incredible complement, especially if you have some walnuts as well. Ah, oh, um, that sounds but, good. And and it just you then just go back and retaste the Vajon and it. And it tastes amazing. And once you've got to know it, um, it also can be drunk through a meal with um, rich, creamy sauces. There are famous dishes made with vin jaune, um, chicken dishes and trout dishes and so on. And for more adventurous um, chefs and drinkers, it works very well with spiced um Broadly speaking, Asian dishes, that's a terribly broad term, I know, but um, there are lots of experiments done by chefs in the Jura region and by chefs now all over the world. Uh, Jura wines are much loved in Japan. It's one hmm. of their most important export markets as well. And uh, the t I've never been there, to, but apparently the top chefs there are constantly experimenting with matches with Vajon and with the oxidative Sauvignons. Yeah. And, and you've had some lovely, uh, descriptors in addition to what you've shared with us. I was just picking up from some of your notes, lemony, crisp, crystallized fruit, warmly nutty. Um, and it's acid driven. And, uh, what I was intrigued uh, though, as well, correct me if this is not, uh, correct. <laughs> the yeast breaks down through autolysis or the final phase of self destruction during fermentation when it releases enzymes that give the wine kind of an umami or that savory deliciousness factor as well. Yeah. Does that, yeah? Okay. <laughs> it's, it's a very technical process. I mean, yes. Um, okay. Yeah. There's, I, don't, yeah. I don't really have anything more to add because no, um, that, I mean, those are good descriptors, it, though, it early a on. To, uh, yeah, you need, yeah. you need the glass in front of you. Absolutely. And how do we serve it? Is it chilled? Is it a white wine glass? Um, absolutely serve it in a white wine glass, yes. Okay. Um, some people do serve it in smaller glasses, especially if it's a Vajon or a Chateau Chalon, which is one of the specific appellations um, exclusively for Vajon, um, simply because it's very expensive and um, you serve small amounts. But Ideally, you should have a, a decent sized uh, wine glass and most importantly, do not serve it chilled. Okay, good to know. Serve it at, um, I mean, I hate the term room temperature um, because it's always too warm. Obviously, you don't want to have it warm, but um, serve it at a, for argument's sake, cellar temperature. And I don't mean the Jura Van Jean cellars. I mean, uh, 13 to 15 to even 16 degrees um, definitely not out of the chiller or out of the fridge. You can open it, ideally open it the day before and just ah. put the cork back in just to keep the dust out. And you will find that it lasts for, if you don't drink it all, for weeks wow. without any problem as long as you store it somewhere um, a reasonably cool, obviously, for storage just when it's open. 
Um, it's and it's a very very long lived wine. Um, <laughs> the other thing to say is that it's in. I very rarely use the word um, this word uh, for anything, but it is in a unique bottle, uh, both mm. shape and size. I'm sorry, I don't have one in front of me, but um, it's all right. We could put one in the show is, notes. Uh, Van Jean is in a, a, a Clavelin bottle, and a Clavelin bottle is the only non-standard uh, size bottle that the EU allows, for example, and it is 62 centiliters, huh. and you are not allowed to sell Van Jean in Europe in any other uh, size. In the US, you sometimes see it in uh, standard half-size bottles in 37 and a half CL. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's got this really curvy, like it's got a, it seems to have a long neck and then it curves out quite a bit. Um, it's, it's sort of dumpy. It's a very, yeah. uh, very <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, squat is a better word. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. It's a very traditional old bottle. Yeah. Uh, well, dig in and enjoy all the tradition. Again, yeah. Tiny, tiny quantity. It's only 5% of the production of the whole wow. of Jura. Holy smokes. Okay. Um, so you have a wine with you um, that you wanted to share. Uh, maybe we could see the bottle first, please. Well, I picked something that was a bit of fun. It's afternoon here um, while I'm speaking sure. to you in London. Yes. Uh -huh. And this is actually from uh, the little region of Bougé. Okay. Um, Bougé is next to Savoie. Um, All right. And it's actually in between Jura and Savoie. Ah. So come south down the Jura Mountains and keep going south and you hit, we're, we're west of Geneva here, and you hit okay. Bouget. And the first Great. area of Bouget that you hit is called the Saudon. And uh, Saudon is the name of a, a, little, a little town, a little village. And in the Saudon area, they are famous for making, um, you're not going to be able to see the bubbles here because there's only a few of them but they're famous for making a pink, sparkling, bubbly hmm. uh, called simply Bouget Cerdon. And unexpectedly, it's made mainly from the Gamay variety. You can oh. also use a second variety, which is called Pulsar, which is a Jura variety. Um, this particular example is 100% Gamay. And you go, well, why Gamay? But where we're thinking of geographically only 50 miles or 80 kilometers to the west as the crow flies is Beaujolais, northern right. Beaujolais. Because sure. I talked about Lyon before not being too far away and Lyon is south of Beaujolais. So um, the other curiosity about this wine is that it's made in the méthode ancestrale. Mm, so the ancient method. The Champagne method, but the method ancestral, which is um, a single fermentation in the bottle. <laughs> um, and so, if you've heard of pet nuts, um, pet nuts are made in a similar way to this. Petulant so, naturel, they're lightly fizzy. Uh, they're trapping the CO2 in the bottle rather than letting it release during fermentation to create a still wine. Correct. They're doing that. And the big thing is that they don't filter out the yeast in pet nat. Well, okay. in this one, they do filter out the yeast and transfer it into another bottle. So it starts off in the champagne or traditional method and ends up uh, as a transfer. Uh, but, but the most important thing is that they never add any extra yeast and sugar which is what you do to make a champagne or a traditional method. So what uh, sugar is in here is completely natural and uh, the yeast are the original yeast. And it ends up being very low alcohol and slightly sweet. Huh. Oh, great. And it looks like a rosé. Yeah. It is a rosé. All it is a rosé. is rosé from Gamay. Gamay okay. or a little bit of Pulsar. Yep. And um, it's only 8% alcohol. Oh, wow. That's great. <laughs> and, Especially uh, these days. Wine, wine to have with fresh strawberries um, mm. or just on its own when you fancy a drink at tea time. I can huh? happily, happily just sort of keep supping this this afternoon and after I, we finish do a bit more work. And 
And so you should. <laughs> and what local dishes um, might pair well, either with that wine or go back to Van Jean? I just wanted to talk a little bit more about food, the local dishes beyond the cheeses, which sound marvelous. Um, are there any others that uh, you want to highlight? Uh, well, in Van Jean, um, I sort of alluded to the creamy sauces. So the um, most traditional dish of all is um, poulet au vin jaune. Or if ah. you uh, want to give it a, a fuller name or and to have more expensive ingredients, then it would be poulet de bresse, so a bresse chicken, which is a particular, the bresse is the region that's in between Jura and uh, Burgundy in the plain there. And they have Do they have the blue feet? I uh, think they are, are they blue? Or, or something red? different about them? Or they red okay. feet? I think they're red <laughs> feet. I can't okay. remember, can't remember, but they're tiny. They're white okay. feathers and they're tiny. Um, oh. And the price of buying one is horrifying. They oh. have a, um, a highway or motorway service station that uh, is hilarious because um, as you're driving down, you you see it because there's this huge metal chicken and <laughs> you, you stop there for a coffee or something. And in their, in their shop, they actually sell these chickens at a vast price. Um, <laughs> but they're... They're obviously very carefully reared, lots of strict rules and all the rest. And How much would a, one chicken cost? I'm just curious. Oh, don't ask me, but, but about... <laughs> You've um, never bought one. <laughs> four times, no, but four right. times as much Regular as chicken. a normal free-range decent chicken. Okay, okay. Um, Sounds like Kobe small, beef or something. <laughs> and smaller as well. Um, okay. But uh, poulet de bresse or just poulet au vin jaune, sometimes with mori, avec mori. Mori are moral mushrooms. Ah, you familiar okay. With moral mushrooms? And, uh, Tell us about uh, them. Uh, oh, um, they're very black. Um, okay. And they are, um, they don't look anything like uh, a normal sort of champignon de Paris. And they tend to be from the spring rather than the autumn. Ah. And they're very, very, very tasty. Um, mm. I, I think uh, in in English we call them moral, M O R E L, um, and in in French it's morille, M O R I L L E S. So okay. they're very flavorsome. So if so, the dish is not a long cooked chicken dish. Um, it tends to be in pieces. Uh, although there are a million different grandmother's recipes for this, and <laughs> it's cooked in ideally in a Sauvignon white wine, you honestly don't have to cook it in Vin Jaune. So you cook it in a Sauvignon white wine, and then you finish it off with the mushrooms if you have them, mm. and with a glass of Vin Jaune towards the end, and oh. that gives it the flavour. Um, and you can do the same sauce with trout. And in fact, they also do a pastry dish um, with with the the mushrooms and the same sauce as well, like a massive volavant. So those are very traditional dishes of the Jura with Van Jaune. Uh, mm. But they the whole of Jura and the Alps as well have in common the fact that apart from that. The essential ingredients are simple peasant food of pork dishes, so all sorts of sausages, um, hams, saucisson, whatever that go beautifully, charcuterie that goes beautifully with these light acid driven earthy red wines. Um, and then cheeses of all sorts, either as cold cheese plate um, or cooked into all sorts of different dishes. Um, so various versions of fondue, raclette, uh, mm. and then tartiflette in Rublachon area. And in what is tartiflette? Sorry, tartiflette, what is that? Um, yes. It's made from the cheese Rublachon. Okay. It's yet another version of um, potatoes that I didn't mention, which once huh. the potato was brought to to France um, is a staple there. So it's baked potatoes, onions, lardon or pancetta, if you prefer, little bacon bits, topped 
with melted cheese in the oven. Mm. Oh. Um, and it goes beautifully with the acid-driven white wines uh, from Savoie, for example, from the Jacquard grape, or even from the Altesse variety. That goes beautifully well. Then in Savoie, you do have big lakes. So there are lake fish as well. And <laughs> there are rivers with trout. So and that goes for Jura as well. You see trout quite a bit. Um, but it, it, it's relatively simple fare, unless obviously you're in some of the better restaurants where they're experimenting with international flavors, especially spices. Oh, that sounds marvelous. It sounds um like a wonderful region to visit, both for, you know to visit the vineyards, the restaurants, of course, if you love skiing. What are a couple other tips you would give to those who want to travel either to the French Alps or Jura? Um, in the French Alps in particular, um, the town of Annecy I mentioned is absolutely stunning, but do try to avoid the very busy time of, the busiest time in France is between mid-July and mid-August. Right. And uh, it's really, really full on. And you really don't want to be visiting Annecy at that point. Um, but uh, get if you go in summer, get up into the mountains and go hiking. Hmm. Um, and if you can, go in June and look for the wildflowers in the meadows oh. and up in the woods they're stunning as well um back in jura there are some extraordinary little villages um one thing i want to emphasize as this is a, a wine show is that there's more and more difficult to visit the producers um especially the trendy names um, okay you won't get an appointment it's simple I can't get an appointment half the time and I write about it. Um, even the importers who some of them for my new book, I'm saying, well, can you tell me how I can get hold of so-and-so who's a newer producer that I want to write about? And they said, we can't get hold of him. So we sell the wine. They won't oh. reply because they can sell all they, they have and they're busy right. in the vineyards. They don't have staff to look after you. Having said that, you will always find some sellers open to visit, except on a Sunday where you might not. Um, so be open minded about it. And in Jura, there are more and more very interesting wine stores and wine bars. And you can try the wines there. And if you are familiar with Jura wines already and familiar with the prices, you'll be shocked at how much cheaper they are if you actually drink them in the restaurants in the region that have been oh. building up their stocks of them. So enjoy that and don't worry so much about visiting the wine producers. That's good Somewhere to know. It's a little bit easier to visit the wine producers, but apart from certain very trendy ones. Huh, great. Um, I, I know time is flying, but I do want to uh, mention your amazing Kickstarter campaigns. I'm just going to give a little background so that people who are not familiar with Kickstarter, but um, you had a lot of creativity and forward thinking in organizing now several Kickstarter campaigns to fund your books. Um, and Kickstarter, of course, is a funding platform for creative projects, including films, games, music, art, technology, and more, of course, books. And supporters pledge various amounts of money to help the creator reach their funding goals to do the projects. Um, the kicker, of course, is that if you don't get enough pledges to meet or exceed your financial goal by a certain date, all of the money is returned to those who pledged and you don't get anything. So um, what inspired you to organize a Kickstarter? It's highly unusual, um, not just for publishing, but in the wine industry too. Uh, well, the first one I did was in 2013. So one year before I published my first book. And the inspiration was the fact that I, I have worked for myself for many, many years before that and since. And I had had one particular project that I think you might remember that was online fairly early that was called Wine Travel Guides. Mm -hmm. And it was a project that had um, a lot of plaudits, uh, a lot of respect and lost me a huge amount of money. Yeah. Um, so that was one thing that was just like, I'm just part that there. 
Uh Another thing was that I had worked myself um, freelance part time in book publishing in wine book publishing, mainly for Oz Clark's publishers. And I'd learned a lot about books and how many they sell and how few books actually sell a large amount. And I had vowed never, ever to write a book (laughs) from my experience. (laughs) So when the whole sort of Jura train started moving and that everybody wanted to know more and more about Jura, I was on social media very early, especially for a European. Uh, Because of Wine Travel Guides, which was an online project, I was on social media, I was doing Twitter, I was doing Facebook, I was um, part of a lovely group of people that used to attend the European Wine Bloggers Conference. And uh, through that, I discovered this concept of um, uh, crowdfunding. And there was somebody who was uh, raising money through another platform called Indiegogo for a, for a film uh, that I, about uh, Rioja. That, and I supported it. And I thought, this is interesting. Hmm. Um, and I very swiftly realized that, first of all, that a book on Jura was needed. Otherwise, someone else was going to write it because other people were beginning to come in. And that I knew more and that really I had to do it. I then spoke to a couple of publishers. Nobody would publish it unless it was going to be Jura and Savoie together or Jura (laughs) and the French Alps together. Jura, Savoie, Bouget is the usual three. And I thought there's so much to say about Jura and they get so mixed up, these regions, they need separating. And I thought, I, I know myself well enough. I'll have too much to write and I'm too wordy. So I will, I need to do it just on Jura. And I don't want to lose money on it. I've already lost money on a project. I don't want to do that again. So I started investigating Kickstarter and Indiegogo and so on. And I started investigating how to self-publish, whether I could. And, you know, I had quite a bit of experience and a lot of contacts. And I began to realize that it was doable. Um, And I'm somebody that tends to read the instructions on things that I buy. Uh First thing I do, you know, get the packet, take the instructions out. I promise you I did it with these uh, new headphones. I read the instructions. And uh, these days things come without instructions and you have to find them online, which is very annoying. But I read the instructions of Kickstarter. And I knew, but most importantly, I had a strong social media following already. I didn't just say, oh my goodness, I'm going to do a fundraising project. I need to start a Facebook account. Right. I already was known for my knowledge on Jura. And I already had a following on Facebook and on Twitter. Instagram wasn't uh, a thing at the, in those days. So, um, and so... I just put it together and um, I learned a huge amount doing it the first time. <laughs> and I that's what enabled me to do it another two times. Um, it isn't entirely, it doesn't entirely fund me or fund the project or anything. It's about pre-sales and it's about right. buzz and it's about getting people excited. And once you deliver the book... Um, if you continue with the social media buzz, then there are all these people with you. And at one point I had to make a very big decision that I won't go into, but I had actually committed for a publisher to publish a book uh, to, for me to write a book for them. Uh, and this is several years ago. And it coincided at a difficult personal time for me. And it coincided when I was trying to produce my second book. And I'd already signed a contract and I thought, I don't like letting people down, but I had done a Kickstarter for my second book. My second book had 450 people, roughly, who had kicked in for that book. Wow. And I had a choice. And I thought, on the one hand, I have 450 people and I've already banked, it was about £20,000 from these 450 people. On the other hand, I have a reputable publisher who's given me no advance. Mm. Which do I choose? Right. 
Sure. It was obvious. It wasn't just about the money. It was about 450 people. And sure. this is the thing. These are these people who are all willing you on. And yeah. the second book, I had a lot of problems and it was late and everything. And yet they were all willing me on. They were all behind me. They were all sympathetic. It's, That's great. Um, so it's about that as much as it's about the money. But my goodness, running a campaign, having just done it again for the third time, and this time with no support, no partner, um, completely on my own for 30 days, it's full on. Wow. It's full on. But otherwise, you won't make it work. Huh. So you're always emailing people and on social media trying to promote yeah. it to get and, people and to pledge. To be yeah. fair, although I got... Um, a very decent amount of money. I didn't actually get the numbers that I would have liked. And it's partly because I didn't get around. To, I'm, I'm so inefficient that I didn't have a good email list. And so I did the social media. Yes. Mm -hmm. But because that was a bit easier to do. And I emailed various individuals, but I never did a big email blast had I except through Kickstarter and right. Kickstarter the platform. And I mean, I, I, a lot of people, not them, but for me, they've been great. And uh, I was able to, at the click of a button, get them to send an email to everybody who supported my first two books. Oh, that's now, great. Course, some people will have no longer had the same email or whatever, but it definitely got me pledges. And uh, that and social media got me through it. But if you could do email as well, you do even better. Well, they say the gold is in the list, email. Like social yeah. media actually and, and, doesn't uh, move as much product or whatever you're trying to sell as an email does. Yeah. And, and, and that's the one thing I just, I just ran out of time. Oh yeah, absolutely. But you still are successful in terms of your okay. campaign goal. So that's very impressive. And I have the hard work to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The delivery. Um, Wink, we, we're going to wrap up soon. Um, this has been fascinating and thank you for giving us and me, especially too, uh, a great mini education on the Jura and the French Alps uh, wines. And we'll all have to get your book, uh, books, I should say. Um, is, is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to mention before we wrap up? Um, I think it's it's mainly to embrace the diversity that both um, Jura and the French Alps have to offer. Um, in the case of Jura, the diversity is in its myriad of wine styles, but also in its mass of producers, small and big. And don't only look for the trendy producers. Be brave and try some of the others. And in the case of the French Alps, the big diversity is in the grape varieties that we've not really touched on today. And they have a whole myriad of different grape varieties that you'll have never heard of. <laughs> Be brave. Try right. them. Speak to your wine store or your sommelier and say, is there an unusual grape from Savoie that um, you've got a wine from and tell me a bit about it and try it. Right. Oh, great advice. Great advice, not just for these regions, but for wine generally when approaching. I mean, the the, the, the joy, the sensory pleasure is all in the diversity of uh, That's why we do it, what we can. It? That, it is. That's why I'm no longer working on orange juice or cornflakes. <laughs> Um, so, Wink, where can we find you uh, online, social media, you and your books? Um, you can find me on Instagram. Um, I don't necessarily post very regularly when I'm writing, but you'll find me there. Uh, you'll find me on Facebook. I don't follow back unless I know that you're working in wine um, or I know you. Um, but you can follow me there. Um, for my books um academy duvan library uh are selling my books now they distribute my books and academy duvan library.com and okay. they have both my existing books and they will start advanced sales in a few weeks or a couple of months we haven't decided yet of the new book sure wine 10 years on so you can find my books there to buy okay. um you just Google me. I have a very unusual name and you'll find me, but please don't barrage me with too many questions these next few months. I'm trying. You're busy. Right. You're kind of busy. Yes. 
<laughs> Absolutely. We will give you your space so that you can give us the book. Wink. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Wink. This has been delightful. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've learned so much. Um, and I am going to say goodbye for now, but don't log off yet. But um, thank you again for being with us and for sharing all your knowledge or a, a small part of your knowledge about Azura and the wines of the French Alps. So good luck with the book. And uh, thank you again. Thanks, Sasha. That was great. Okay. Thank you. All right.